Devil in the Fog by Leon Garfield Dramatised for radio by Martin Jameson Episode 1 The Stranger Go on! Otway, onward fine steed! He doesn't like the rain, father. That's me, George Treat. Just 14 years and hair as red as an autumn leaf. I wasn't expecting it that day, but I'm the hero of this story. Or as my father would say, the protagonist. Yes, I don't like the rain either. That's my youngest brother, Hotspur. He's only thick and he can't fear death it. I'm not pushing us out. It's not my turn. There's a list. It's in the ledger. I fear I'm getting a chill. It's you, George and Edward. You're not using my books to wedge the wheels again. That's Edward, Rose and Jane. Henry, my other brother, he's asleep in the back. Nell hasn't said anything because she's shy. (laughs) Yes, I know. It's unbelievable. A member of the Treat family who's shy. Last time you completely ruined my tragedies of William Shakespeare. Last time, last time, treats. My darling treats never look back, never brood upon the past. My dears, my teeming nest of geniuses. And that's my father, Mr Thomas Treat, the genius of geniuses. The past is but the material with which we build the future. But what is the future, Father? That's the future. London, Drury Lane, the footlights, hot, flickering wisps of candle smoke are stinging of our eyes. The audience, silent. Now, as they gripped in marvel at the newer stars to inflame the firmaments of their imaginations, and then a theatrical establishment of our very own. The family treats Palace of Illusion. (laughs) I don't think we're going to London now. Edward, Edward, the future is golden and gold cannot be tarnished, not even by your prosaical exclamations. That's not what he means, Father. It's a highwayman. Whoa! Money or your life? Alas, sir. We are but poor players who strut and fret our hour upon the stage and then are heard no more. And certainly not paid very much. It's a big wagon. You must have something. Treats, prepare. We have a visitor. Junk. Oi, hands off. It's not junk. Junk and children and... A load of old rope. A stage flying machine constructed after the principles of Archimedes, with a few unique improvements courtesy of my own invention. It's a compound pulley. Try not to tangle the rope. You could take it, of course, but in the wrong hands. It would spell certain death. You know what I want? Jewelry, silver, gold. George's hair is gold. Shut it. Our future is golden. You could take that. What about this basket? The properties of our art. Yeah, property, I like the sound of that. Yeah, uh, wings. And crowns. An angel's robe. And devil's horns. Oh, 30 pieces of silver. Hey? I might keep these for myself. Betrayal. Sharper than a serpent's tooth. I'll have that. Keep them, sir, for they are but tin. What? Oh! I should pistol the lot of you and be done with it. Properties of the imagination, sir. Now do you understand? What about them jars? No, no, sir, not the jars. This stuff looks pricey. In these jars, sir, lurk the mysteries of the natural world. Oil of sugar, Berlin syrup, crystals of violet, salts of fire and crystals of lemon. Lemon. Fierce and deadly as a tiger. Pilfer but one, and I cannot be held accountable for your life. You said lemon. <laughs> oh, God! Oh, oh, what is it? it? What is it? Too late. <laughs> it has escaped. I do but pull the stopper on this retort, and the vapors will conjoin to conjure the smoke of Lucifer himself. Lucifer? Could you no. avert your eyes? What? Father, don't! Not the smoke of Lucifer, Father, please. Father, no! I have no choice. No, 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 don't, don't. Stop, stop. It is too late. You're a lunatic! You're a lunatic!
Has he gone? He's still running. My geniuses! <laughs> my treats are performance fit for the king himself! Father, don't! No, not the smoke of Lucifer, Father, please! Father, no! <laughs> <laughs> he truly believed we had no money! <laughs> Suffice it to say, we were never much rich in coin. But I can tell from the lines on my father's brow that the coffers are a little emptier than usual. Then again, we are on our way to Rye. See, us treats travel to the Mermaid Inn at Rye twice a year, and that always casts my father into his most sombre dumps. What happens in Rye, I hear you ask? It was what didn't happen that wet and freezing November that nearly had us all in the dungeon. The Magistrate? Either that or you pays the money you owe me. Pennies. Guineas! Three days you've been here, you and your seven wriggling pups, board and lodging. The longer we stay, the more money you make. I have an appointment with remuneration. You have an appointment with the justice. He has no patience with defaulters. In the meantime, you can sleep in your wagon, the lot of you. And before you think about making a run for it, I've taken your horse. Oh, what? Onway! Because of the stranger. What about the stranger? It's the 6th of November and there's no sight of him. I ought to tell you about the stranger. Not that any of us like talking about him. You see, that's why we come to the mermaid. Third day of June and third of November. Like clockwork. Nine o'clock in the evening. The clatter of the carriage without. And then, the tavern door, and he's there. A black, flapping cloak bringing the darkness in with him. His eyes, roomy pinpoints deep under the shadow of his tricorn hat. Peering, uncannily. And father, my genius father. I can feel his grand spirit flicker and fade. They go into the darkest of corners, talk briefly in the shadows, and then, as swiftly as he came, the stranger disappears into the night. But the next day, there's meat on the table, and a better class of inn to sleep in. New clothes sometimes, too. It's been like that for as long as I can remember. So, it's the stranger that brings us money? But this time, he hasn't come. Now Father's in front of the beak. Thomas Street, I sentence you to four hours in the stocks. Take him away. <laughs> sir, sir, I entreat you as one so obviously cultured, refined and a, a lover of fine arts, fine clothes, fine food. Is this an attempt at flattery, Mr. Treat? Perhaps I could settle my debt in kind. A complimentary theatrical presentation for the good customers of the Mermaid Inn. A cornucopia of, of visions, apparitions, dragons, cherubs, um, in honour of, of you, sir. Mr. Crabbe, is this acceptable to you? Well, I'm not sure. To our gift in your name, Mr. Crabbe, to the citizens of Rye, the, the hungry and thirsty citizens of Rye. So... The beak decides that the good folk of Rye would best be entertained by an improving rendition of Abraham and Isaac. <laughs> you know, where God tells Abraham, played by father, to sacrifice his only son, played by me. Father sports a red beard, red to match my hair, right down to his waist. It's going surprisingly well, considering Mr. Crab makes us wait until a quarter after nine until the inn is crammed to the rafters with every paying drinker the town can offer. Father... Yes, my son. We have the fire and the wood, but where is the sheep for the sacrifice? Oh, 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 my son, my son. Father, what dost thou? Watsman, do you have the crystals? Yes, father. Wherefore is there a knife grasped in your hand, raised above me thus? Rose, pull the stopper from the retort. Funny. Stand clear, my treat, stand clear. Isaac, Isaac, my only son, 
The angel of the Lord bade me sacrifice you as a burnt offering upon the mountain. Now! Oi, Drake, what do you think you're doing? We're summoning the angel of the Lord, dressed as you will see, in the likeness of the Justice Cooper, through my finest stage illusion, Lucifer Smoke. You can't summon an angel with devil's smoke. Oh, devil's angels, sometimes it's hard for the mortal heart to know the difference. But then, a hush descends on the drunken throng. It never fails, does Lucifer's smoke. First, a wisp of yellow. Then a column veined by fire. Billows of violet. Cascades of vermilion and emerald like a thousand shooting stars. Henry and Edward are pulling on the ropes. We can't hold it much longer. Ready for Jane to fly down on the hoist as the angel of the Lord. But before she can... Thomas Street. It's the stranger. His tricorn hat looks like horns through the smoke. So, you've come at last. But I will come no more, Mr. Treat. My principal instructs me. I will come no more. After 13 years, 13 years and now you say no more. Go and tell your principal, 13 years is too long. What must I do? Answer me, you dingy devil, answer me. Father, father, stop. He's gone. He's gone, father. Right, that's it. Out, a lot of you. I'll have no black magic in my establishment. Get out and take your devil's paraphernalia. to say. Where did you go? Hotspur was crying for you. I, um, needed to think. Father? Father, have you been crying? No. <laughs> no. The stranger, his words, your words. You said 13 years. And considering my age, i got to ask, is this something to do with me? Is you in good heart? Yes, Father. And of strong spirit and high ambition? Of course, Father. For ain't I a treat? No, George. You're not. You're not my son. You're the child of a great nobleman. Rich and mighty. You have another father and, and a mother, too. Another name and another world. Which, with your genius and talent, will become a universe, my dear. But then, who am I? You are George Dexter from Blackstone in Sussex. I don't understand. Thirteen years ago, dear George, I was nothing more than a travelling conjurer with no more to my credit than a handsome wife. Mother. We had no children then. It was June, Sussex. The inn at Blackstone. Nine in the evening. A most violent thunderstorm. The door burst open. And in the steaming blackness stood a stranger. He elbowed his way into the parlour before me. And I saw in his still tripping arms a small child, just short of a year in age. His hair, his hair, a tangle of sodden red locks. Me. Sir, the child will die of wet and cold. It wouldn't be a bad thing if he did. My principal would not be distressed on that account. And your principal must be the devil himself. Then take the child. Bring him up, if you will. Or drown him in the nearest river. 
But if you do take him, my principal will pay you 30 guineas every June and every November on condition that you keep away from this place and out of Sussex. The principal will insist on that. What if I refuse? Then I'll bury this brat where he dies, for he'll not survive this stormy night. And thus it was that you became George Treat. And the stranger came to Rye every June and November since with a fee of 30 guineas as agreed. Yeah, Rose guessed as much about the money. But now, my dearest George, the bargain, it's broke. Because he said that he'll come no more. My conscience shouts aloud for you to be returned. To where? To Blackstone Manor. How do you know that? The great house was but a mile from the inn. You was not soaked enough to have come further. When your mother and I heard about a baby gone missing, stolen, well, we guessed you was probably the only son of Sir John Dexter. But by then... By then... You was being paid 60 guineas a year? No, no, George. By then it was too late. We loved you as if you were our own. Yes, Hosper. This is the village of Blackstone. What should we call you, George? I don't know. Lord George. Baron George. Prince George. King George. Hey! <laughs> off with your poor old suit. Get it off. There's robes in the basket. And a crown. You'll need fine clothes if you're to be presented at court. I estimate a fortune of 10,000 a year. You could buy a hundred flying machines. George won't be interested in pulleys and potions anymore. I will. You'll have to learn manners. Play the part, dear boy, as you've played it many times before. Be courteous, but not humble. Be overbearing. Great gentlemen are always overbearing. Only fools are overbearing. Everyone's a fool who's not a treat. Hot spur. Sorry, George. Whoa! Is it? I can't see a house. It's along the drive. Beyond that copse of silver birches. Of course. Well. Treats, here you must stay a while. For George and me, as business at the manor. I'll miss you, George. It is a most historic sadness. Goodbye, George Treat. And a pleasure to make your acquaintance. George Dexter Squire. Oh, George. It's very big, the house. Indeed. A mansion. Vast. Tremendous. Rich. Very rich. Well, they're a long time are coming. Perhaps they're away in town. No, they'll come, my boy, they'll come. Perhaps we should go by the tradesman's door. Oh, remember who you are, George. This is the door for you. And don't you look a part and all in your finest. Who is the principal? Listen to me, dear boy. Never ask that. Never speak of it in the house. Forget the principal. God willing, he'll forget about you. Your father? Uh -huh. No, Mr. Treat. Better? How shall I ever get used to it? Be excellent. Be courteous. Be loving. Be gentlemanly. In a word, be a treat. For whatever you was truly born, George, you've cleaned advantages as my... with us. Use your genius, but not for too much inquiring. Gentlemen, don't ask. They either know or keep ignorant with a smile. Yes. <clears throat> the name's Treat. Thomas Street, we are here to request an audience with Sir John Dexter. Well, you can. Go away. Uh, no, 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 you don't understand, my dear fellow. It's a matter of the utmost importance that brings us to your master's door. No, you don't understand. Sir John's at another door. Death's do. He's dying. Joseph, who is it? A mountebank and a son by the look of him. No doubt hearing of the master's affliction and come to sell some quack medicine or other. How dare you, sir? 
Let them in, Joseph. Madam? Sir John has requested that no visitor be turned away this day. Are you sure? This day of all days. If you please, gentlemen. George, you go first. Is that my mother? Shh. I hope you'll not think me a monster when I tell you that the news my father is dying doesn't plunge me into an anguish of grief. Try as I might, I have no memory of the man. Just a little further. Now we walk what seems like ten miles past a hundred empty rooms and a hundred paintings. Dexters by the dozen. Red-headed Dexters. Staring down at me from the centuries. Reproaching me for my heartlessness. In here, gentlemen. Lady Dexter. How is he, Dr. Newby? And not long now. Not long. This don't surprise me. The air's stale and thick. It's a wonder any man can breathe in here. And we're not the only visitors, neither. Though it's hard to make them out in the gloom. What is it ails, Sir John, may I ask? The peaceful departing of this world. May God have mercy on his soul. That looks like the parson. And we're none the wiser for it. Should we be afeard of the contagion? In the jar. There. Pick it up, boy. It's lead, sir. The round from a pistol. Miraculously extracted from Sir John's left lung. Miraculously, but at the cost of two pints of blood. He, he, he was shot. Who did this deed? Who is it? Who has come? Mr. Thomas Treat, sir, and his um, young companion. Who? Who is he? Step forward, boy. He cannot see. Sir? Red hair. I had red hair once. It's a pleasure to make your acquaintance, sir. What? What is your name? George. George. This is George Dexter, Sir John. I've brought you back your son. <gasps> Silence, you scoundrel. You won't kill him here and now. Oh, Dexter, please sit no, down. No, please, please, unhand me. Mr. Treat. You walk upon dangerous ground. I have proof, sir. This shawl and, and this, um, you know... Give that to me. What is it? George's rattle. His rattle. I treasured it all these years. Mr. Bennett, do you think this boy can be who he claims? He has red hair. A fool. He is handsome enough. Too handsome, perhaps? Madam, no. Dr. Newby? Mum? Your opinion? Come here, boy. Sir? When George Dexter was an infant, that wretched nurse let him fall on the terrace. I remember. He suffered an injury, uh, a cut, deep, shaped like a comma, uh, over his right eyebrow. Of course, yes. I have a scar, sir, here. Oh. Then look, Mum. There's no doubt. This is George Dexter indeed. So... So you've come home? Mother? Oh. My son? A son? I have a son. You are not George Dexter. You cannot be. Oh. Who's this? In the corner, a bundle of black with a sickly, wizened face. I didn't notice her before. Mrs. Montague, I did not ask your opinion. Because you know I've been talking to George Dexter these past 13 years. God help me. Oh, God help me. I've never spoken to this lady in my life. That is because she swore to me that you talked to her from beyond the grave. I warned you about her. I told you not to lose faith. I told you we would find George one day. And you must recover, sir. Your son needs a father as well as a mother. Mr. Treat? <clears throat> sir? I thank you. You have done me a great service. Or a great crime. I think an explanation is called for, Mr. Treat. So, Mr. Treat, he tells them everything about that stormy night in June 13 years ago, 
the stranger and the mysterious principal who, it seemed, had stolen me from my parents, and the bargain with Mr. Treat, and the bargain being broken, his conscience, and all the rest of it. And for his pains, they give him a thousand pounds, and the kindness to let him and me make our farewells alone. Well, George, fine house, eh? Worthy people, my boy. Noble, rich, exactly as I told you. Except that my father is about to die. And you are his only son, an heir to a vast fortune. That is little comfort, Mr. Treat. It's as if I've lost two fathers. But you've found a mother again. She's a great lady, but... George? It isn't easy to call her mother. You'll grow to love her, George. You have an affectionate nature. Well, a thousand pounds? <laughs> what will you do with your windfall, sir? The family treats palace of illusion, of course. London at last, eh? We'll make our names. I'll come to see you soon. Um, perhaps not. No, not, not at first, George. You have a new life, and we must grow a little apart, you and I. Mr. Treat. Now, I must go. Mr. Treat! Do not embrace me. Do not embrace me. George Dexter, Esquire. That's me. But it troubles me being a Dexter when the bed I sleep in now is big enough for seven. And I'm sure you know the particular seven children I'm talking about. You see, no matter how hard I try, everywhere I tread in this house has me thinking of the treats and the fine adventures they'll be having. Even though there's all those Dexter portraits staring down at me from the walls. I'll swear they can read my thoughts. Trying to drum the treats out of my head. You're a Dexter now, boy. Be a Dexter. Don't think about them treats. You're not a treat here, boy. Well, at least that's what I think they're saying. The library. I'll read a book. Take my mind off it. Forget about the treats. What Edward wouldn't give to have sight of so many learned volumes. George? Hello, Mother. You're fond of books? Uh, no, not especially, but um, my brother... Would, I mean to say, someone I know would like them very much indeed. So why did you come in here? This house is very big. I'm, uh, I'm trying to get acquainted with it. And what do you think to your new home, George? Oh, it's, it's vastly elegant, madam. Vastly elegant? Vastly. Do you like the paintings? Um, <clears throat> they are vastly elegant as well, Mother. Some are more pleasant to the eye than others. That one in particular. That's an empty frame, George. No, I mean, the frame is vastly elegant, but the painting ain't because it isn't there. This is not amusing, George. What happened to it? Is it damaged? We will go to see Sir John. Perhaps he is awake again. Wait, and, and here, there's a, there's a scrap of... Come away! Canvas. Mother? Uh, it is a... It was a picture of the man who shot your father. What, some rival family? Why would you hang a picture of your enemy in the library? No, George, he is a Dexter. Captain Richard Dexter. He is your uncle. We will speak no more about him, do you understand? What was it Mr Treat said? Use your genius, but not for too much inquiring. But then again, I remember another thing he said. If you have a talent, dear boy, it is a sin against God himself not to use it. I find Joseph in the kitchens. Joseph? Mr. George, sir. Shall I help you with those poops? No, sir. It's my job, sir. Is it your job to do what I ask of you? I would reckon it is, sir. Then tell me about Captain Richard. Her ladyship says we are not to speak of him. I know he shot my father. I ask only the reason why. It's the entail. What's the entail? There's a poison, a sickness, a curse. A real curse? No, but in truth, it is a devil's pudding. Oh. 
What's the devil's pudding? The entail is a law that says the Dexter estate and the Dexter title and the Dexter fortune can only ever pass to a male child. What is this to do with my uncle? <sighs> Captain Richard had a son, Bertram, strong as an ox. While your mother bore three boys into the world, each one to perish within a week of entering it. Until I was born. You was a sickly child, too. But even your mewling and whimpering was enough to stir a festering canker in your uncle. As if you was stripping the riches from him your very self. Stealing them from under his nose. So, so he was the principal. Captain Richard was the one who kidnapped me. Sir John refused to believe it. How could he credit a Dexter, his own brother, with so vile an act? Your nurse, the one that dropped you, she fled and was never seen again. Sir John believed that gypsies had taken you, but I always thought that a most unfair slur. Mrs Montague told Mother I was dead. Many of us believed Captain Richard had performed the foulest of deeds until a month ago. Your father's attorney, Mr Craddock, heard rumours that you were still alive. Also, certain unwise mentions from disreputable officers in your uncle's regiment that the devilish captain held the key to your long concealment. Oh, my father went to find me. He pleaded with your uncle, knelt before him, begged, but Captain Richard denied it all. Oh. He laughed. Oh, he's a scoundrel. Worse. Sir John flew into a rage. The dark, boiling rage that had been denied for 13 years accused him to his face at last. Your uncle had no choice. Admit a crime or challenge your father to a duel. No, but my uncle's a soldier. He's familiar with a pistol. Horribly familiar. Oh, so my father's a dying on my account. The captain was thrown in the new gate for dueling. The principal was locked away. The bargain was broke. And I was returned to Sir John. You should be proud. There's not many a boy of 14 as the noblest blood in England spilled on his behalf. Well, it's little wonder his portrait was taken from the frame. It wasn't taken, Mr. George, sir. It was ripped. George. <clears throat> George. What? Why are you looking at me like that? What's the matter? Is it father? Is he dead? No, no, no. Your father is recovering. Dr. Newby has confirmed it. He says it's you. You are a medicine, a physic in human form. A miracle. This morning, Sir John has taken hot meat broth. I've done nothing, Mother. You were talking in your sleep. Something about Lucifer's smoke. How long have you been here? I have brought some plainer clothes for you to wear day to day. What's wrong with my clothes? Hey, that's my finest coat. I am partial to green brocade, aren't you? Red shoes, George. Silk stockings shot with gold thread. A waistcoat of silver lace mounted on yellow water tabby. Yeah, fine, ain't they? I shall keep them safe. These new clothes will serve you adequately. Yes, Mother. And, George, now you've made yourself known to the household, there's no further occasion for you to spend all your time in the kitchens gossiping with the servants. I don't mean to displease you. Today we have a visitor. Mrs Rumbold will be here at 11. Your father will sit up in the brown drawing room to receive her. You are indeed just as I'd heard. What had you heard, Mrs. Rumble? Mr. Bennet advised me as to what a remarkably fine-looking young man he is. Thank you, Mrs. Rumble. Mr. Bennet also told me of your life as a travelling player. Oh, those days, uh, they are behind him. Oh, tell me, George, did you play Shakespeare? Popular selections from time to time. <laughs> Julius Caesar. Friends, Romans, countrymen... Lend me your ears. Oh, Hamlet. To be or not to be, that is the question. Oh, Romeo and Juliet. 
Eyes look your last. <laughs> Arms take your last embrace and lips. Oh, you the doors of breath seal with a righteous kiss. A dateless bargain to engrossing death. Ooh. Here's to my love. Ultra apothecary. Thy drugs are quick. <laughs> Thus, with a kiss, I die. Oh. <coughs> oh, my God. He's dead. Call Dr. Newby. Get up, George. <coughs> yes, Mother. Oh, he's alive. Oh, oh, sir, isn't he the thing? Hardly like a Dexter at all. Mrs. Rumble. I mean to say the, the quality of his acting made him a, a different person, not a Dexter, which is clearly what, what he is. I am tired. I am exhausted. George and I will follow you to your carriage. Joseph? Oh, so soon. Madam? Uh, yes, um, well, uh, goodbye, Sir John. He is sleeping again. It is best we leave him swiftly. But he's not asleep. Father's staring at the painting above the grand stone fireplace. He's the first Sir John Dexter. Hair as red as flame. An arrogant hand upon his hip, scowling down at him. No words are spoken. But it's as if they're wrapped deep in some secret discourse. George. Sorry, Mother. Walk with me. Mrs. Rumbled is waiting. She seems most amiable, Mother. You will never do that again. Never. Do you hear? I speak but for your own good, George. My son. For your own good. It's December now, and five weeks of Dexter. But what's good for me, George Treat, and what's good for me, George Dexter, seem like two quite separate things. I lie in bed and I dream that I'm a treat again. And I'm shouting at Mr. Treat, louder than his conscience. Mr. George. And telling him to leave it dozing a while longer. Mr. George, <coughs> wake up. Joseph, what are you doing here? Look upon this, Mr. George. Look upon it and burn the face in your mind. It's a painting. The painting. The painting of your villainous uncle, Captain Richard. Right, well, it's very fine. <laughs> Mark every slippery feature. He's smiling. I didn't think he'd be smiling. And um, well, he might smile. Oh, yes. Joseph, why are you showing this to me? Because the murderous gentleman has escaped. Father, come here. Stand close to me, boy. Good morning, Mother. George. What do you think of him, madam? Does he not look like the nephew of a felon? I've seen more ill-favoured youths, Sir John. Where? Uh, Where? Uh, in houses as noble as this. His complexion. Is it not coarse? It is the effect of too much air. A little longer in this house, and, well, he'll be as pale as the rest of us. As the rest of us. Your father has bad news. My uncle has escaped from Newgate, I know. Gossiping with the servants. And Joseph came to me. I did not seek him out. Gossiping? Sir John. Joseph showed me his likeness so I might be on guard against any attack. On you. Are you good with a gun? I have some quality with weapons, sir. Mr Treat was not neglectful. It is a necessary in the arts of the stage. What arms are you proficient with? Musket, pistol, blunderbuss, poniard, rapier, short sword, broadsword, dagger and mace, sir. Mr Treat instructed you. Did he not teach you to shoot with a longbow? Your father would not wish you to be at a disadvantage. Madam. It is a compendium of hostility, Sir John. You could perhaps allow yourself a moment of pride. I do not mean to hurt you, boy. You do me the honour of being gentlemanly. And you do not 
betray yourself for the pain that I cause. I cannot wish for more from a son than that. Sir John? We are not to be disturbed. Mrs. Montague. Particularly by Mrs. Montague. I have received a letter from Mr. Craddock, your attorney. Instructing you to stay away from this house or face charges of false pretenses and witchcraft. I know nothing of this. I did it in defense of you, madam. In memory of our 13 amiable years, I beg your pardons and forgiveness. Did you play such a cruel trick purely in the pursuit of amiability? Are you so starved of companionship that you rely upon imagined spectres to make your introductions? Look, woman, the boy is here in front of you. I was lied to by a dead child. Who is there left to trust? The living, Mrs. Montague? Oh, yes, indeed, ma'am. And I'm glad that I should be proved a foolish old woman by so handsome and lively a young man. Come here. Madam. Come here. Yes, Mrs. Montague. Oh, George. How much nobler you are than the complaining babe who deceived to take your place. Oh, wicked, wicked ghost. The corpse at four, be it the corpse. Stand away from him. Wicked ghost. Mrs. Montague, I do not doubt that if you hope for Sir John's pardon, you will leave at your earliest convenience. Yes, of course. Good day to you, Lady Dexter. Good day. Sir John. George. I have said all that I came here to say. She looks me straight in the eye when she says that, as if to make certain that I've understood her. The cops at four. Be it the cops. Why on earth have I come here? The gloomy winter sun is fading fast. Freezing cold. The air is thick with salty sea mist. Swirling shadows. God rest ye merry gentlemen. Let nothing you dismay. Ah! Mrs Montague. Remember Christ our what can she want with me? Does she want me to plead her case with my father? Does she want to kill me? To slip a knife into my breast to add me to her stock of talking spirits? Which brings tidings of comfort and joy. Comfort and joy. Which brings tidings of comfort and joy. Who's that? Step out where I can see you. So... You're my long-lost nephew. Captain Richard! Don't move. In episode one of Devil in the Fog by Leon Garfield, George was played by Joe Dempsey, Mr. Treat by Tim McMullen, Sir John, Sam Dale, Lady Dexter, Juliet Aubrey, and Joseph and the Stranger by Sean Baker. Mrs. Montague was Joanna Munro, Dr. Newby, Ian Batchelor, and the Highwayman and Captain Richard, Ben Crow. Hotspur was played by Raymond Karemi Taheri, Rose, Fern Deacon, Edward, Hugo Docking, and Jane, Lauren Moat. Devil in the Fog was dramatized by Martin Jameson and the director was Mark Beebe. Devil in the Fog by Leon Garfield Dramatised for radio by Martin Jameson Episode 2 Who is the Principal? long-lost nephew. Captain Richard! Don't move. And call me Uncle Dexter, why don't you? Till we're better acquainted. Where is she? Who? That monstrous witch, Mrs Montague. <laughs> what makes her a witch, nephew George? Because she consorts with the devil. I'll wager that's me you're talking about. Well, they didn't lock you in Newgate Jail for nothing. Have you come alone? No. 
There's a dozen following. Twenty. And you have a blunderbuss under your coat. I'll wager that as well. <laughs> I'll run. In this light, you'd never get a shot. <laughs> and I'll not chase you neither. <sighs> not with this leg. What's wrong with it? <sighs> Did you never wrench a leg iron off your ankle? Come on, boy, help me sit. Put the pistol down. See? It's uncocked. No, no, it's a trap. As you wish. Cover your nose. Legs starting to smell. Not very elegant for an officer. Nor a fugitive. Because you shot my father. I have something to ask of you, nephew George. I've no wish to be called your nephew. You ain't got 20 guineas about you. Ten guineas would suffice. Five. After what you've done? I left every last sixpence with your Aunt Dexter and your cousin Bertram, their need being far greater than mine. What's that? I don't know. Mr. Constables, come and hunt me down. You did betray me. Let go! Shh. Let them do their worst. For whatever passes, you shall not live to sneer at me and inherit. I swear... I swear, I never knew you was here. Why should I believe you? Because no one saw me leave. Dexter, treachery is in your blood. Mr. Richard! Oh. Master George! Mrs. Montague! Madam, why did you not call out before? We took you for the law. My finger was on the trigger. Have you asked him? I don't have 20 guineas. Not the money, nephew. I might have five shillings. Do you think I bolted from Newgate and ran and limped and crawled and dragged through stinking ditches in mortal terror of everything that moved to beg five shillings from a boy. Well, then what? What do you want? A reconciliation. Tis his only chance. Tis the only chance for my wife, for my son, Bertram. A reconciliation? With your father. You tried to kill him. It was an accident. It was a duel. One most severely provoked. But kill my own brother. Scare him, yes. Make a fool of him, yes. With a bullet in the gut? I was trying to miss. He fell into the path of my shot. Well, why should I believe you? You are the principal. The principal? What principal? The principal. Who had me kidnapped when I was a baby. And you paid Mr. Treat 60 guineas a year to keep me hidden. No, no, that's not me, nephew. I know it was you. Do you know how much a soldier is paid? Not precisely, no. You think I have 60 guineas a year for kidnapping babies when my own flesh and blood are an inch away from starvation? I suppose... It's not, Captain Richard. Hearing of your return, my heart soared. That's why I risked all to escape and come here. You are the one who can prove my innocence. The true villain will be revealed. I know him only as the principal. Well, then the principal is my enemy too. He is my accuser. He's destroyed my life. Master George, will you plead on your uncle's behalf? If the time seems right. My father's not yet recovered. Thank you. Thank you, nephew George. I must go back. They'll be wondering where I am. Ah, uh, nephew! Uncle Dexter? Do you have that five shillings? Such is the despair in my uncle's eyes that only the coldest of hearts could not believe him. It's my resolve to talk to Sir John in the morning. Perhaps, with my Uncle Dexter proved innocent, we can discover the true identity of the evil principal. But when I comes down to find Sir John, there's a visitor sitting in his chair. Dear, dear George. Mr. the treat. Let me look at you. A gentleman. Lap of luxury, security, golden future, love all around. Couldn't wish for more. Oh, Mr. Treat, is that a bandage on your hand? Oh, right. It's a scratch. And you're weak. <laughs> singed. Oh, yeah, and singed. <laughs> singed. Which brings me to the purpose of my visit. To humbly beg of you the small sum of £70. But Sir John gave you a thousand. Gone, dear George, gone. Where are the others? They're very well, my geniuses. Very, very well. Are they in London? That sooty seat of ignorance and Matchwood. Matchwood? Do not speak to me of London. But your plans, sir? The Treat family's palace of illusions? Could you not find a theatre to purchase? It was a triumph. Of course. A modest building, but 
well located in the Haymarket. Oh, the centre of the world. Our opening performance, Saul and the Witch at Endor. Oh, I wish I'd been there. With Lucifer's smoke. And the Devil's Fire. Berlin syrup. Oh, pine. Flakes of nightshade. Six ounces. Six? <laughs> a spectacle was demanded. Grandeur. A fiery glory such as kings might gape at. But six ounces? It's never been chanced before. All grand and adventurous things bear the spice of danger. Did it work? Um, Mr Treat? The theatre burnt down. Mr Treat? Sir? One speck of disaster and all triumphs is forgot. But Edward, Rose, Jane? Nell, Henry, Hotspur, they fear not. They're in Shoreham at the old Cutter Inn, awaiting a ship. Fresh worlds to conquer, my boy. For which we require... Um, 70 pounds for our passage to Virginia. Well, I would have to ask Father. Oh, for, forget I spoke. Um, but the boat leaves on Christmas Eve. Sh should you be able to visit <clears throat> before then? Mm. Pass the brandy. Is the pie good, sir? <clears throat> it would taste better if you'd spoken to my brother as you swore. We had a visitor, Mr Treat, who cared for me for 13 years. Sir John was too tired to receive him. Perhaps Mr Treat is the principal. Well, that's plain ridiculous. I heard he was paid a thousand pounds for his pains. If Mr Treat hadn't taken me in, I would have surely died. There was a storm that night. I was soaking wet. The principal told the stranger to let me perish if needs be. It was June. A hot summer's day. There was no storm. No. I remember it vastly well. It was your first birthday. A miraculous occasion. You were a sickly child. And none of your brothers had made six months. Which is why you are blamed, Uncle Dexter. Without me, your son Bertram stands to inherit everything when Sir John dies. It's called the entail or some such. Well, then why aren't I murdering you here and now? It's the entail that accuses me, not the evidence. House was full of guests. Lady Dexter truly shone with happiness. My mother. No. Your father was called away on urgent business for the estate. Then Mrs Smith runs in, howling. He's gone. The baby's gone. Mrs Smith? It's your nurse. Oh, she was a drunk. She was the one what dropped you and gave you that scar above your eyebrow. Your mother, on the other hand... She was as white as a sheet, oh silent as the grave. Her kind heart curdled on that day. Joseph told me that Mrs Smith disappeared. Not till your father returned. The shadow on his face oh. when he found out that you'd been snatched. Oh, that was a storm. A storm in his heat. He blamed the gypsies. But he never took his eyes off me. Everyone knew what he was thinking. That you'd taken me. No one paid attention to the nurse running off a few days later. Nor to the travelling player slipping out of Blackstone at the same time. Yes, but what about the stranger bringing Mr Treat 30 guineas every June and November? Did you count the 30 guineas or was you just told of it? I... Wait, wait. Mrs Smith had a husband. Perhaps he was the stranger. Coming twice a year to advise your Mr Treat as to when your return might be most profitable. I don't believe it. I can't believe it. Mr Craddock would know. Your father's attorney. He would know if Mr Smith is still alive. Hmm? If there's a connection between Mr Treat and Mr yeah, Smith. Well, right to Craddock. Craddock knows everything. And I know that Mr Treat loved me like his own son. But if he's guilty and has gained your affections for profit, then he'll be back calling on you for more funds and more. Beware of this, nephew George. For it points the finger of guilt somewhere you might not like. My uncle's words cast a cold shadow across my heart. So I'm glad I haven't told him of Mr. Treat's request for another £70. It has to be wrong. But if I'm so sure of Mr. Treat's honesty, then why am I awake in the middle of the night, scratching that letter to Mr. Craddock? So please. And <clears throat> you provide any information you may have about Mr. Thomas Treat and his associates. <sighs> Yours, George Dexter Esquire. I beg of you, leave now. And I beg of you to show me 
and Bertram just the smallest morsel of mercy. Go to the village. I will send money. But I implore you, madam, go now before he sees you. But that is the purpose of my visit. <sighs> Mother? George, let me introduce you to your Aunt Dexter and your cousin Bertram. Is this him? Hello, Aunt Dexter. Oh, if it weren't for the red hair, I'd have said he was almost too handsome for a Dexter. I think I must take after my mother. Do you, George? Say good morning, Bertram. To him? Bertram! I don't want to. Say it! Good morning. Good morning, cousin. Now, you see? Now, George is returned. There's no more cause for enmity between Sir John and my husband. If Sir John could pardon him, then Richard could become a free man again, rather than a fugitive. Nothing like will come of it but aggravation and distress. Madam. Oh, Sir John, it is a joy and a relief to see you so recovered. Your sister-in-law was just about to take the carriage into the village. On the contrary. Christmas is upon us, and we must be hospitable. Take these unfortunate people and see that they are rested and fed. Sir John. Do as I say. Go. Madam, please, follow me. Come along, Bertram. Mother. George, wait a while. Father. I'd have you be amiable to them, boy. They are not to be blamed. Bertram doesn't seem to like me. You have everything now, and he has nothing, except the name. So take no more advantages than are yours by right. I don't understand, sir. Do you hope for my friendship and love, George? Of course, Father. Then you will understand. You will remember my wishes. Where is it? Can I help you, Mr George? Hey, there was a letter. I have posted it for you, sir, to Mr Craddock. But there was no address on it. Oh, I took the liberty of glancing within. You read it? You have been deceived, most likely by Mrs. Montague. How do you know? Who else would suggest that anyone other than Captain Richard could be the principal? You see, Mrs. Montague has always been the closest of acquaintances to the captain. Some would say too close. Some would... Raise an eyebrow that it was Mrs. M who recommended Mrs. Smith to be your nurse. Some might wonder that it was Mrs. Montague who claimed to speak the dead George Dexter from beyond the grave. Why? To stop your mother from finding you alive and well and able to inherit. That's why. Oh, it's as though the principal lurks in every shadow. Well... I defy him. Or her. Cousin George. What are you doing here? My father said I was to make you welcome. This is a library. I shouldn't think it of interest to you. There's a matter we must talk about. I doubt that very much. Cousin. Cousin Bertram, is something troubling you? Yes, Cousin George. You are. Well, I'm sorry for that. Why? Did you fancy we'd be friends? No. Nor enemies neither. My mother says you was brought up by vagabonds. Cheap, showy vagabonds. You certainly talk like one. You should have stayed with them. For no matter what blood runs in your veins, it wets a vagabond's heart. Mm. Talking of blood, Cousin Bertram, uh, your nose is bleeding. No, you're mistook, vagabond. And your eye, look, it's black and swollen. Your cheek is bruised, your hair's pulled out and your ears and ear dragged off. What? That's a terrible gift I learned from my vagabonds. The gift of second sight. You looked a moment like you was beaten half to death. Cheap little player's trick. They're ashamed of you. Sir John, your mother, every word you speak brings a curl to their lips. You dingy little beggar. Me a beggar? Yeah, a beggar who's never earned a farthing save by holding out his hand and whining, mm, I was born a gentleman, sir. I'm a Dexter, sir. Give me my money and clothes. And you fancy yourself better than us with gaudy stage trickery and flowery actors' words? If the treats is showy, it's because they've got something worth showing. They don't think their name is all they need to make them a man. In truth, I'd rather be a treat making an honest day's pay than a, than a useless scarecrow who... Bertram? You have an audience, Cousin George. 
behind you. Father. Mother. George. Bertram, leave us, aunt. No, let him stay. Sir John. Quiet. Sir, I spoke out of turn. But I do think of them, sir, and the treats are leaving for the new world tomorrow and from Shoreham if they can find seventy pounds. Of course. Father? You must go to them. You're not angry. Such oratory, rich and fiery. Did you not think so, madam? Indeed. Indeed, indeed. You are not injured, Bertram? No, uncle. Then tonight you will sit with each other at table and tomorrow, George, you will take a horse and ride to Shoreham to visit your friends for one last time. You'll give me 70 pounds. And another 30 for what you will. Confused. Amazed. At dinner, it's as if my father has been born anew. Ladies and gentlemen, a toast to George and Bertram, cousins and friends. Cousins, cousins and friends. friends. More wine, Joseph. More wine. Bertram leans over to me, smiling for my father, but whispers in my ear. I'll destroy you, George Dexter. What's that you say, Bertram? I said to cousin George how much I'm looking forward to Christmas, sir. And how grateful we are for your hospitality. Oh. Good. <laughs> Very good. I can barely sleep thinking this must be some trick my father's playing on me. When I wake, my finest treat costume, my green brocade coat, my red shoes, my silver lace waistcoat, the clothes my mother took from me, are laid out. Just perfect. Magnificent. Good morning, George. Mother? Joseph has a horse ready for you in the stables. Why do you look at me like that? George. Oh, the clothes were laid out for me. If Joseph was mistaken, I can, I can no, change I again. I put them there while you were sleeping. Did you? You look splendid, George. Splendid. Here is a hundred pound. Mr. George, sir. Thank you, Joseph. And this is your father's blessing for a safe journey. A pistol? Between here and Shoreham, there's a veritable autumn of cut purses and highwaymen. An autumn of highwaymen? They're not thick as thieves. They're thick as leaves. <laughs> thick as leaves, I see. And God forbid you should encounter you know who. Who? A certain captain by the name of Richard. I'll, I'll watch out for him. Well, if he should stand in your path, won't well, Joseph? There is a charge in your barrel, ready to let a little daylight into his dark head. I must be gone. <sighs> Mr. Treat cannot leave until I get the money to him. Gone. Godspeed, Mr. George. Godspeed. Happy Christmas, geniuses. Happy Christmas, George Dexter Esquire. George, treat. George isn't a treat anymore, Hotspur. We're going to America, George. Father said you'd bring the money for the journey. Yes, I have it. The boat leaves at noon. Well, where's Mr. Treat? Here, dear boy, and charmed to see you, dear old. Oh. Dear George. Mr. Dexter looks pale, doesn't he, Father? Uh, not pale, child. Elegant. Elegant. Did you find out who the principal is? I thought I had. But now, I'm not so sure. You look very worried, George. And not vastly happy. Nonsense. He's rich, loved and hugely well situated. Ain't that so, George? Yes. Indeed, Mr. Treat. Couldn't you come away with us, George? I have a family, Hotspur. A father and a mother. Just the three of you? You must rattle around in that big house like three peas in a great big drum. It does sound a little lonely. Great gentlemen have no need of conversation to be content. You have to go. It's nearly noon. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, gather your things, Treats. If only I'd got here earlier. We're not going to see you again, are we? You'll forget about us. No, Hotspur. I can never forget you. But I am going to miss you so very, very much. George, 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 George,
grandness the future holds, nor what glories are to come, we'll think on you, George. Father. And our, our, our genius thoughts will conquer oceans and mountains and, and visit you in your comfort and quiet. We'll never quite be parted, dear boy. Oh, yes, of course. Um, come, treats away. I'll come to the quayside with you. No, George, dear, dear George, it's better that you stay. We must look forward. Father! Not back. And they're gone. A lifetime flashes before my eyes. A lifetime of genius. Of plays performed, triumphs and disasters, gawping, cheering audiences, and vegetables thrown and villages chased out of. Henry snoozing in the wagon. Rose stooped over the ledger and chastising Mr. Treat for his profligacy. Edward with his nose in a book. Jane practising her ladylike airs. Little Nell too shy to speak. And even little a hot spur. Wrapping his arms around me. A lifetime. Gone. And suddenly, I feel a great rage at Mrs. Montague and Captain Richard for daring to suggest that my Mr. Treat could possibly be anything other than an honest man. Oh, you rogue! You monstrous old bag! We're back! We missed the ship! I don't understand it! I think they left us behind deliberately. Well, there'll be another one in a few days. You still have the 70 pounds? Oh, no. Uh, you see... <laughs> I, I paid the captain, handed him the purse, but while we were gathering ourselves, waiting to board, purchasing you know, a few essentials for the journey on the quayside, the sailors, perhaps too keen to catch the tide, cast off. I, I shouted, Wait! You have my fare to the new world! But to no avail. The wind took my words and consequently... my money. The whole 70 pounds? Lots a few pounds between friends. You've plenty more after all. Is that how you think of me now? Uh, George! What's wrong, George? I'm sorry, Hotspur. I'm not sure I belong here anymore. George! Come back! Sergeant Doubt, Captain Mistrust and Colonel Suspicion are my companions as I ride back to Blackstone. Did Mr Treat really give the money to the captain? Is that why he stopped me from coming to the quayside? So I shouldn't see him slipping the money into his own pocket? Is that his plan? Just as my uncle suggested, to be a leech of the darkest intent. Is Mr. Treat the principal? Whoa, boy! Money or your life! I have 30 pounds. All right, boy. Just wait while I get my purse. Huh? You're just going to give me your money? Take out your weapon! I have no wish to fight with you, sir. You can have the money. A boy and a coward. No, I'm no coward, sir. But I'm no murderer either. Then I will have to shoot you. And you give me no choice. Fire if you dare. Whoa, boy, steady. Nephew, you all right? I didn't shoot. It wasn't me. No, it was me. Is he dead? Spied him standing by the road an hour ago. As you approached, he slipped behind a tree, put on that mask. From that moment, my pistol was cocked. <sighs> He's still alive. Not for long, I'll wager. Sir, I did not want to hurt you. Only a joke. Only a joke. <laughs> a joke. He's gone. Straight to Hades. I've never fired a gun in anger. I'm not sure I could have done it. Let me see, though. Um, who gave this to you? Joseph. Look, the barrel's cracked. Oh, yes. You were lucky I was here. If you'd fired your weapon, the charge would have blown back into your own face. You would have been killed for sure. How did you know I'd be on the road? Joseph was in the Dog and Shepherd this lunchtime. Mrs Montague heard him gossiping to the landlord. I hear your Mr. Treat came to claim an early harvest. It was money for passage to Virginia. I'll wager he found some reason not to board the ship. It was 70 pounds. It was hardly a fortune. The first touch of the leech is light. But once fastened, he'll suck and suck until you're dry and bloodless as a bone. Well, talking of leeches... Ah, yes. I hear you fell out with young Bertram. Do your family know you're here? No. And they mustn't. My wife is a fine woman, on occasion... 
But her tongue is loose. She'd surely blab and soon the constables would be upon me. But you trust me? More than your own son? Bertram is an oddment. But there's good in him if you dig deep enough. It's growing dark. They'll have heard the shot. You must deny everything. You cannot explain this man's death without giving me away. But you saved my life, Uncle. I'm a wanted man. This adds murder to the list of charges. What about the body? I'll bury him in the woods. With some respect, Uncle, I beg you. Of course. Although, you'll not be needing this warm cloak and hat where he's going, eh? I'll talk to my father. He was in an exceptional mood last night. Perhaps after Christmas Day, he could be open to persuasion about a reconciliation. Meanwhile, I'll stay hidden in the cops. It is safest. How will you eat? I can't take any more food without raising suspicion. There's victuals for the taking, if you know where to look. I have 30 pounds, Uncle. Left over from the money my father gave me. Take it. <laughs> You're a prince, nephew. Flesh and blood, eh? George! My boy. I'm sorry, Mother. Father. The ride home took longer than I expected. Thank God. You're alive. Yes? Should I not be? We heard a shot. I heard it too. Far off, as I was passing through the cops. Your father feared the worst. I cursed myself for letting you ride alone. I reminded Sir John that you were on. I prayed that you were as accomplished with the pistol as you claimed. It would have been a tragedy to lose you. Again. Bertram? I saw nothing. The roads were clear. Then... I wonder what it was we heard. If I may, Sir John, the landlord at the Dog and Shepherd complains of pilfering from his kitchen, pies, sausages and bread. A dangerous vagabond is suspected. <laughs> Stealing a pie is hardly dangerous. The kitchen maid was terrified by a gaunt shape and a sinister silhouette was seen limping behind the hedgerows towards our cops. <sighs> The, the landlord asks that you might lead a manhunt on Boxing Day, Sir John. Oh, Sir John is not well enough. Nonsense. A hunt. Magnificent. You and me, George. Father and son hunting together. Sir? We'll see how well Mr. Trees has taught you, cousin. I've dreamed of this day, George. Dreamed of it. Uncle? Uncle, where are you? It's me. Mr. George. Oh. Mrs. Montague, what are you doing here? I was pondering on how to get a message to you. Well, what's wrong? Where's my uncle? Uh, have you come to wish us a Merry Christmas Day? I only have a minute. No gifts. We have a gift, don't we, Mrs. Montague? Uh, a gift, indeed. Uh, listen, you're in great danger. Tomorrow morning, my father is leading a hunt for the marauding vagabond who's been stealing pies from the dog and shepherd. And tasty pies they were, too. This isn't a joke, Uncle. I'm to accompany him and prove my qualities as a huntsman. Your life is in peril. Oh, my friend, I fear it isn't me who is being hunted. What? Show me your pistol again. There was more light this morning. Uncle, there'll be constables. And a crack in the barrel of your gun that will kill you the instant you fire. You think it was done on purpose? There chisel marks above the casing. Remember your friend, the highwayman, goading you into firing your weapon? I'll wager he was tipped off you'd be on the road with 30 pounds in your purse. A joke to scare a boy with a pistol. He'd not have known his joke would blow you to bits. It was Joseph gave me the weapon. Are you saying he was trying to kill me? Well, not Joseph. He lacks the wit. Who knew you were riding alone that day? Everyone. The question is to ask if the gun room is kept locked. The question is to ask who would gain from my death. And the answer is your son, Bertram. I'm the only thing standing between him and the Dexter estate. He vowed to destroy me. But he hates me enough to kill me, Uncle. Simply because I am George Dexter. No, friend. I am not your uncle. Nor are you George Dexter. Where are we going? I was digging a grave for our highwayman friend, looking for the most secret spot somewhere hid by the thickest thorns. He was digging a grave when he found another. Another what? Here. 
Another dead highwayman? No, my friend. A child. You don't have to look if you're afeard. It's just bones. Tiny bones. Old bones. An infant, no more than a year. George Dexter. George Dexter? Or the real George Treat? No. Perhaps Mr. Treat killed his own boy, seeing more profit in keeping the son of a wealthy baronet. No. Never in 10,000 years could Mr. Treat harm a living soul. Not even a landlord or a magistrate. Never mind a baby. You're mad, Mrs. Montague. Not so mad that I imagined a dead child talking to me for 13 years. And there he is, Master George. There he is that spoke to me. But if that's the real George Dexter, then someone at the manor knows you cannot be him and they want you dead. Whoever you are. The stranger. The stranger holds the key to this poor baby's demise. Cover it up again. So, my friend, it is you who are the prey tomorrow. What should I do, Uncle D Friend. Take my pistol. It's near enough to twin of this murderous little instrument. What about you? If you fire that, it'll explode in your face. True. But you, George, whoever you are, you have more need of a weapon than I. I go to bed, but barely rested. My mind's a swirl with nightmares. Visions of the stranger on that stormy night in June. Take the child. Take the child. Take the child. Destroy the brat where he dies. Destroy. Bury the brat where he dies. Destroy. Father. I pray you're good with the pistol, George. Father. Mr. Treat killed his own boy. Angel of the Lord. Bad he sacrifice you as a burnt offering upon the man. Bad dream, Mr. Joe. No. No, thank you, Joseph. I'm just nervous about the hunt, that's all. There's a heavy mist rolled in, Mr. George. Perhaps we should put it off for another day. It will give you the element of surprise. A bit more time to take your aim, Mr George. Raise the gun. That's a good straight line from the hammer to your eye will do the trick nicely. Yes, Joseph. Your father is on the terrace. He's waiting for you. His father. He's waiting by the copse. I, I can't see anything. You need to follow the path. Wish me luck, Mother. Are you frightened? No. Yes. A little. Oh, George. Where is it, Mother? I'm so sorry. What do you mean, Mother? Go. Go, he's waiting. You're late, cousin. I, I couldn't see you in all this fog. No matter, nephew. The future. The future is all that matters now. Yes, Uncle. We'll take the cops from three sides. I from the south, you, Bertram from the east, Sir. George from the west. But where are the others? I thought there would be officers from the town. We don't need officers, George. We're Dexters, are we not? Yes, Father. Have your pistol up and at the ready, your eyes straight ahead. Like this, cousin. Be ready to fire at the slightest movement. God rest ye merry gentlemen. Let nothing you dismay. Except the principal, or the stranger, or whoever it was killed that little baby. Let nothing you dismay. Except someone lurking in this mist what wants to kill me. Who's that? George, it's me. 
Mr. Treat, I have to talk to you. More lies, Mr. Treat. Trust me, George, there's someone you must meet. But I don't trust you, Mr. Treat. He's here, in the clearing. Suddenly I can't breathe. For the damp black cloak, the roomy pinpoint eyes and the tricorn hat, like the horns of the devil himself, silhouetted in the swirling mists. It's the stranger. Hello, George. Get away from me. You devil. No, George! Wait, you're a devil too! A scoundrel! George! Now leave me alone! It's true. It's true, it's true. Look at me. Sir John, who's he talking to? I said turn around. It's Captain Richard. Except... I paid you ten pounds to waylay the boy. Except the captain's wearing the dead man's cloak and hat. You could have had another thirty, but he never set eyes on you. And through the mist, Sir John thinks he's talking to my highwayman. You contemptible little thief. No, father, stop! Ah, boy, good, 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 that's him! Shoot, boy! Shoot before he escapes! I can't. Don't be afraid, boy. Hold the weapon up, your eye to the hammer, aim and fire. Fire, boy, fire! Why don't you use your pistol, father? Because I command you to fire! I command you! Do it, boy! And what will happen then, Sir John? What are you talking about? You're the principal, aren't you? It's you. You want me to kill myself with a broken gun. I want you to save the village from a thief and a vagabond. That isn't him, Sir John. Well, who is it then? It's me, brother. No! Oh, you! Always you! George, run! Run! No! Ow, my leg! It is broken! I can always beat you in a fight, brother. And look at my prize! Your pistol. The pistol I shall shoot the boy with. You'll get the blame, of course, after I've killed you too. Why don't you run, boy? No, sir, please, don't fire it. It gives me no joy to do this, boy, but I must. I made the most terrible mistake. When my beautiful little George died in his cot, quite naturally, I promise you, it was his birthday. Unbearable. Impossible. The entail demanded the estate would go to Bertram when I died. I panicked. Pretended to be called away on business, buried George in the woods. I contacted my attorney, Mr. Craddock, told him the boy had been kidnapped, that he might never be returned. I told him to find another red-headed infant, to strike a bargain with the boy's father for the day when I would need an heir again. Mr. Craddock was the stranger. Why did you goad me into dueling with you? To make you a murderer. To have you arraigned and hanged. To destroy your family once and for all. You Mad brother. Bedlam mad. And you are a coward. You tried to miss. Where is your pride, Richard? I had to fall into the path of your bullet. I don't understand. After all that, you're going to kill me. It was a mistake. You are not my son. You are too coarse, too bright, too gentle, too handsome. You've seen the portraits, George. All the Dexters, the way they stare at me, accusing. I had to recover, find a different way. Because I can't let you take it, George. I cannot let you live. Don't shoot, sir. Ah! Sir John, I'm afraid, has left us. The pistol exploded in his face. Oh. We must get you to the house. Oh, thank you, Mr. Craddock. I tried to warn him. Dear, dear George. Don't touch me. I never want to speak to you again. Dr. Newby has been summoned. I don't understand, George. Why won't you come with me? You lied to me about everything. Your brothers and sisters are waiting for you. Oh, you're sure you haven't sold any of them? The bargain fed and clothed us for 13 years. I never imagined it would have to be repaid. <laughs> well, then you are not the genius that I thought you but were. then when it was, it meant sending you to a world of riches such as us trees could only dream about. 
I've got George Dexter's scar above my eyebrow. You cut me with a knife for 60 guineas a year. And that was my doing. Your father ran from the room. I stopped up my ears. What kind of a father would let his son be hurt by anyone? One who loves you more dearly than anything in the world. Well, after what I've learned today, I don't have a father. You have a father in me, George, if you so desire. I would be proud to call you my son. Father, no! Quiet! I changed 50 of you for one of him. Mr. Treat, sir, will you consent? Pause a moment, Captain. I believe I have first claim. How so? I knew from the day he arrived, as only a mother can, that he was not my son. But, George, I have grown to love you, as only a mother can. We might do much for each other, George. Mr. Treat, you must decide. Another thousand pounds, Mr. Treat. Two thousand. No, no, no. George Treat is my son and he's not for sale. You didn't say that 13 years ago. Because there was a storm that sunny day in June, a storm raging in my heart and it's been raging ever since. A storm that can never abate unless, dear George, please, please, unless you agree to be my son again. And he looks at me, and his eyes are quite moist, as are mine, quite afloat with tears. George. Oh, father. My father. So, I am a treat once more. George, the gentleman genius! The gentleman genius! Back in Blackstone. The manor is somewhat more cheerful these days, although mists will always inhabit the copse, swirling through the silver birches. But at least the dead little gentleman sleeps in the churchyard now, next to his father, and talks to Mrs Montague no more. In episode two of Devil in the Fog by Leon Garfield, George was played by Joe Dempsey, Captain Richard by Ben Crow, Mrs. Montague, Joanna Monroe, Sir John, Sam Dale, Lady Dexter, Juliet Aubrey, and Joseph and Mr. Craddock by Sean Baker. Mr. Treat was Tim McMullen, Aunt Dexter, Claire Harry, Bertram, George Sanderson, and the highwayman was Henry DeVass. Hotspur was played by Raymond Karemi Taheri, Rose, Fern Deacon, Edward, Hugo Docking, and Jane, Lauren Moat. Devil in the Fog was dramatised by Martin Jameson, and the director was Mark Beebe. <laughs>